This is a paper that appeared uh, this May on phenomenology and the cognitive sciences, and it's something I've been working on with uh, Matteo Mossio, who has been, in a sense, my in in recent years been my 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 mentor, my in 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 the ways of um, biological autonomy, uh, and because I come so something a little bit of um of um contextual uh, remark about what I do. I, I, I was trained as, as a classical philosopher uh, and a continental philosopher working mainly on, on German idealism at the University of Padova, which is, is a big, rich school uh, on that, that, that works on, 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 on those topics. And uh, during my PhD in Paris, I, I met Matteo Mossio for the first time, and I was struck by the the, the convergence and similarity that I found in, in some of the um, uh, of the account that Hegel proposes about teleology and, and Kant. So my 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 first supervisor, Luca Letterati, which has been also my co-author in in several occasions in the past years, is uh, was always it was one of the first scholar that took uh, Hegel's philosophy of uh, nature seriously in a time where it was not really taken seriously in the in the mid nineties already. And he is very specifically uh, obsessed with, with teleology. And when I went to Paris and I met Matteo, I was struck by the, the similarity of the, the tradition that Matteo was working on, uh, was working in, so the, the Varelian tradition um, of biological autonomy, autopoiesis, uh, et cetera. And, and what um, these old German guys I was uh, reading, uh, like Hegel, Schelling, and, and Kant were, were, were thinking about. So my, 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 after, after concluding a PhD, which was mainly historical on, on romantic philosophy of nature, I started thinking about, well, perhaps it's, it would be more interesting is something that not many th people do will, was not only to reconstruct what these people were saying, but actually give provide a, what I like to call recently a contemporary interpretation of, of that stuff. And so what, what those concept, conceptual models um, can 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 teach us today in a sense. This is something that I've been, I've been arguing a couple of years ago in a paper on on uh, you know it's it, it was a book chapter on so called integrated HPS and the idea of integrated HPS as a uh, of HPS uh, integrated history of philosophy of science as um, providing an, an archive of theoretical alternatives that you can use to to address our contemporary problems and this this project on Hegel is part of that wider uh, approach uh, to to to, the, to this issue. So the paper is um, essentially part of what me and Matteo have been the first piece of what we would like to be a, a larger project that will probably take a few years maybe a little bit more than a few, uh, um, concerned with, we call it, we call the genealogy of intrinsic purposiveness, which is the idea of, well, of course, as I'm going to argue in, in a minute, there's, uh, teleology is widely considered as a solved problem as in, 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 in so-called teleonomical terms, but there's been, what we want to do is actually emphasize that there has been a tradition that goes through Kant, Hegel, um, and like, for example, uh, well, Bergson, for example, in, in, on the metaphysical side of things, uh, but then Varela, Rosen, uh, that have been taking seriously the, the idea that you, you cannot discard intrinsic propositiveness as, as a concept that doesn't, that's not useful for, for thinking about organisms. So, and what we do in the specific paper is um, we focus on what is called the, the inactive approach, which is the, the result of the second part of Varela's uh, um, theoretical endeavor, especially when in a book that I'm going to mention in a bit on from 1991, which is called The, um, the uh, Embodied Mind. Uh, and we try to um, assess the specific role that the inactive approach uh, occupies within the, the landscape of embodied co cognition. And what we, we try to do so by bringing to the fore the specific way in which uh, the inactive approach conceives of the relation between intrinsic purposiveness, agency, and cognition. And what, um, what when we use, again, we use this, the historical side 
of uh, of uh, did, did with historical reconstruction to uh, kind of make making a, a theoretical point about um, about contemporary uh, the contemporary landscape, and we characterize the inactive approach as taking a Hegelian stance with regard to this notion. And as I will argue, this this characterization is not merely a myth of the precursor, but does some conceptual work. At least what in one what we want to try to do. So as I was saying, the um, the critical, uh, the main critical target of um, a project that is uh, concerned with the genealogy of intrinsic purposiveness is the mainstream concept of um, of teleology of, of that it's the mainstream concept that has been used to uh, address the concept of of, uh, of teleology, which is to teleonomy. It's a concept that was formulated by Pittendrick in 1958, and then was especially uh, popularized by Meyer in a series of papers. This is this 65 paper is one of those, but there are many in the 70s, and and was largely taken up. Uh, so Meyer was one of the main defenders of the so-called um, modern evolutionary synthesis. Was one of the the main advocate and engineers in the sense of the of the modern evolutionary synthesis, and which of course uh, converged with um, uh, with uh, what um, uh, Monod and Jacob uh, with the with contributed to which is the the, the, model, the molecular revolution and the the the, the interesting the, the role of the interesting role of, of teleology is, is of teleology as teleonomy is well represented in in a very famous motto by by JBS Halden who also was one of the fathers of, of uh, modern population genetics that it says teleology is like a mistress to a biologist. It cannot live with other, but is unwilling to be seen with her in public. Um, and um, people like like um, François Jacob in the very famous uh, book La Logique du Vivant, so uh, translated in English as the Logic of Life, uh, says uh, that well, finally we don't have the problem anymore because we have the concept of genetic program, which finally gives a legal status to that hidden affair. So now. There's basically teleology is, is a done deal. This is also something like very influential philosopher of biology, like like Michael Ruse, arguably one of the founders of philosophy of biology as a discipline, says, "Well, well, teleology is a done deal. We have we have a genetic um, genetic program. We have um, evolution by natural selection. Problem solved." So um, uh, that. The, Teleonomy is essentially, in this definition, a pro any form of process that is directed by a program, and evolution writes the program. It's evolution, as to use uh, a term by, by by Dawkins, is the the, the blind watchmaker that or the the, the blind uh, software engineer uh, that writes the program and turns the, that that, that govern, in turn governs developmental and behavioral processes. So basically, it's done deal. But so the question is, is it the problem really solved, and arguably there has been a, a big debate in recent years, since the early 2010s, on 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 the fact that maybe we should rethink or extend the the, the modern evolutionary synthesis with the the key focus on uh, gen genetic variation and and, and selection. Uh, and one of the uh, philosophical advocates of this turn is, in my opinion, one of the more outspoken advocates of this turn is uh, Dennis Walsh, who in this very nice book from 2000, uh, the book is from 2015. The, the, I have a quote that is from a previous paper, uh, which it's which is very uh, useful and I use it a lot in this context because says, uh, Dennis says, contemporary biology has resp essentially responded to the problem posed by natural purposiveness of organisms by the simple expedient of ignoring it. So basically we, we look the other way. Um, and in the in the sense, the kind of argument that people like like Dan Walsh, but also um, Kevin Laland, uh, who was a biologist working in in St Andrews, and uh, Gerd Müller, who was one of the editor of this very important book in 2010 on the extended evolutionary synthesis, one was one of that um, more or less forged the, the label of the extended evolutionary synthesis. And all these people say that um, in, in different ways, the natural selection uh, explain, explains evolution of organismal form and function. And yet, in order for this process to unfold, purposive organisms mar, must exist and be struggling for existence in the first place. Otherwise, if you don't have uh, organisms that struggle for existence, you don't you don't have no no selection, uh, nothing to select from. Um, 
So in this sense, people uh, like, like Dennis Walsh, but also Matteo Mossi or Leonardo, Leonardo Bic, who's also one of my colleagues here, um, the teleonomics perspective overlooks a fundamental distinction that was formulated by Kant between uh, extrinsic purposiveness as design and intrinsic purposiveness or as autonomous agency. Also, agency has been a hot topic in philosophy of biology and theoretical biology recent, recently with a lot of conferences been, being organized with the idea, well, maybe we, need, we, we do need to think organisms as agents, but how are we going to think um uh, that more precisely it's, it's a big it's a big it's a big debate um so essentially why well evolution by natural selection naturalizes uh design so we we, we don't need intelligent design anymore because we have extrinsic because because we have um uh evolution by natural selection it, the, it leaves intrinsic purposiveness completely untouched uh and the the, the tradition that was essentially developed in, in, in broad lines here at the University of the Basque Country by the, the Alvaro Moreno School and, and on the one hand and the the an active approach that was mainly developed by by Ezequiel Di Paolo. So we, I would say that Ezequiel Di Paolo and, and Alvaro Moreno and and and, and their co-author have, have mainly uh, been responsible for developing the two sides, as I will argue in a bit, of Varela's legacy. So the more early Varela, Varelian uh, work on, on biological autonomy and the later Varelian work on, on, on the inactive approach from the 90s. Um, so this general approach uh, um, essentially argues that teleological notions are not should not just be understood as heuristic shortcuts, as the teleonomical approach uh, tends to argue, because and rather argues that biology, biology and cognitive science should integrate a naturalized account of intrinsic purposiveness in their theoretical framework. So in in, in recent years, at least since like uh, 10 years, I would say, um, there's been a series of papers that have been published, uh, a couple of papers um, by Francesca Michel Michelini and we, with other co-authors from, from, from the University of Kassel. Uh, very nice paper, book chapter by Victor Marquez, which is not very, uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to find because it's in a, it's in a book about Zizek, uh, so, but it's an absolutely wonderful paper. Um, and me and Luca Letterati, as part of my project, edited a, um, a special issue of the Hegel Balletin on, on that was entirely, entirely dedicated to this. And the, the most important, what the most relevant papers there are a paper by Andrew Cooper and one by Edgar Maraguat that Kind kind of make the the connection between um, Hegel Hegel's approach to teleology and contemporary so called organizational approaches to function. Um, so what we do so we we rely on all this previous work, but what what we do in this paper we go a step further and we try to say that uh, uh, the proximity between he the Hegelian stance and biological autonomy holds for a specific strain of the theory of autonomy, namely the one on the right, which is uh, an activism. Um, so this is kind of like the, the general setup of the of the of the, of the paper. Um, so um, what we argue, as I was saying, the the um, in the paper, the fact of qualifying uh, the inactive approach as Hegelian does not is not just a myth of the precursor. I mean, it's not just okay. Hegel said that Hegel was great. Uh, period. It was what we're trying to do by qualifying the inactive approach as. Um, uh, as Hegelian is to try to pinpoint its the, uh, theoretical foundation and philosophical foundations with regard on the one hand to the autonomy tradition, as we will say, as I will try to argue, there's at least two, two parts of the, that tradition that have slightly different uh, epistemological commitments and also within the, the larger landscape of embodied cognition. Uh, so what we characterize the uh, Hegelian stance with regard to intrusive propositiveness is, is a truthful move. So the, what characterizes that stance is a truthful move and which on the one hand roots agency, organismal agency and cognition into the fact that organisms are intrinsically purposive systems. And on the one hand does not try to ground that mechanistically but rather assumes it as a, as a given 
uh, and try as, a, as, a, as an explanance, not as an explanandum, um, and uses uses it to address behavioral and interactive abilities. And the, the, the approach of Dennis Walsh in this respect is also very, very paradigmatic, the, the, the ecological approach proposed by Dennis, by Dennis Walsh. So of course, we cannot get into any of this without at least mentioning what all of this starts from. Arguably, all of this, the, the philosophy of nature of German idealism, and I'm thinking especially of Jan Schelling and then Hegel, um, cannot be understood ever without the, the, the incredible um, legacy and the very complicated and controversial legacy of Kant's critic of the power of judgment. Uh, we, me and another uh, young fellow, uh, August Nas recently published uh, this this year also another paper in studies in history and philosophy of science, uh, yeah, studies in history and philosophy of science that deals with the the fact that this controversial legacy was not only controversial for the the, the immediate post Kantians but it's still controversial today and if you uh, if you look at at contemporary references to Kant in contemporary literature in theoretical biology or philosophy of biology it's still very interesting to see how the legacy of of Kant is has been interpreted in two radical the different ways with two different um, uh, theoretical and epistemological commitments. But this is not the story for today. But anyway, so the, the, the main problem that Kant left to the post-Kantians when it comes to uh, organisms and, and organismal agency, organismal teleology, is the so-called antinomy of teleological judgment, which is famously articulated as the antithesis between two, two, two propositions. And the first one argues that all generation of material things and their forms must be judged as possible in accordance with merely mechanical laws. Uh, so because Kant was essentially a Newtonian, Kant said was strongly committed to mechanism as the only true causal power in nature. And on the other hand, there you have phenomenological, almost what we might say a phenomenological evidence that when you look at living beings, they they are weird. They don't seem to behave mechanically. And, and thus, the, the antithesis of the antinomy of teleological judgment goes like some, some products of material nature, namely organized beings, as, as Kant would call them, uh, cannot be judged as possible according to merely mechanical law because they have all these weird features that necessarily lead us to judge them as teleological. But then, of course, since um, uh, Kant was, was committed to mechanism, this phenomenological evidence cannot be taken at face value. And in a sense, the way I like to think about this is with through a terms by, by Wilfred Sellers. Uh, Wilfred Sellers is famous for many things, but one of those is um, the, the distinction between manifest image, manifest image and scientific image of, of, of man. Uh, and we, I like, well, the way I like to think about this is the, the, the antinomy of teleological judgment as portraying um, a clash between the manifest image and the scientific image of, of the organism. Because on the one hand, uh, organisms are, at least look, look as if they are intrinsically purposive entities. Um, but on the other hand, we have a very strong commitment to, to mechanism that, so this is not and cannot be the case since the only legitimate explanation is mechanistic. So in a sense, it, it, this is one instance where you uh, you realize how the, the kind of the way classical German philosophy was uh, framing the problem is incredibly uh, uh, con it's incredibly consistent for us today, and still and still true, because the the the, the large domain of mechanistic thinking in biology kind of like re resembles, and it, the concept of teleonomy, as developed by, by and as popularized by Meyer, kind of like stems out of this very problem. Um, so, and what what I take to be the the, the, the fundamental takeaway of of, of post-Kantianism uh, when it comes to teleology. So the, the, the first philosophy of nature of Schelling, which is, 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 a, is a gold mine in that sense. And, and then of course, Hegel in the sense of logic and in the philosophy of nature. Uh, what we might consider these people as being saying is that, well, if the phenomenological evidence that organisms are purposely being clashes with the assumption that nature behaves only mechanically, 
One strategy might also be that we call that assumption into question and consider nature as the true kingdom of ends. This is a word play with, with kind of practical philosophy. So purposiveness is something that is rooted in nature and not something we project on nature, which was uh, Kant's um, position. And thus, in a sense, we could say that um, both Schelling and Hegel, at least, yeah, young Schelling especially, but then arguably that this is a route that goes goes up also to, to later Schelling and, and Hegel throughout, throughout his life, um, argue for a form of life-mind continuity of what, uh, using a, a term by Ivan Thompson, uh, somewhat idiosyncratic for a formulation, but I think a useful one, mind is lifelike and life is mind like so you have a, a form of continuity between between life and mind um one very nice example again of this uh short circuit with, between classical uh classical uh, approaches and contemporary approaches is this um I would say it's similar seminal paper by Andreas Weber and Francisco Varela is a paper that was published one year after Varela's death and Andreas Weber was a, also a little bit like me, a, a, a classic uh, German scholar working on Jonas and, and Plessner and German philosophical anthropology. And then he read Varela and said, well, what this guy says is pretty close to what my German guys are saying. And he went to Paris and worked with Varela. They were working to the, with, on, this, on this paper and then Varela passed, unfortunately, um, before the paper was, was, was published, but then uh, it, it appeared in 2002. And, um, was one of the first paper that inaugurated uh, phenomenology and cognitive sciences as a journal, uh, of which Varela is one of the founding editors. And in this paper, which was absolutely crucial for my for the development of, the, of these projects of mine, is they say that we, we we can boldly advance the conclusion that after two centuries we can move beyond the unstable position set out by Kant in the critic of the power of judgment and therefore provide a fresh re-understanding of natural purpose of li and living individuality. Uh, and then their argument, of course, is especially centered on, on, on Hans Jonas, uh, and they don't really talk about Hegel at all, almost, uh, but they say there is life current in modern thinking that advances uh, um, a rediscovery of theological thinking aligning with a marginal but steady need for many biologists to take teleology seriously that is persistent from the 19th century on up to the present. And arguably, although they don't talk about romantic philosophy of nature or uh, idealist philosophy of nature, because for many, in many quarters, uh, German idealism and, 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 romant and romanticism is a synonym with like crazy uh, metaphysical vagaries that we don't want to be in, involved with. But actually, uh, my, my, my contention is that uh, it's a very important place that if, if we want to think about this in this way, uh, German idealism is a way, is one of the important places you should be looking in. So and, and in coming to specifically more on Hegel, uh, in the science of logic, the way Hegel approaches this is with the famous or infamous uh, idea that teleology is the, the truth of mechanism. That is, uh, of course, it's something that uh, you're not supposed to be saying at a philosophy of science conference, but I've been trying recently and trying to, 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 to argue that it's not completely as crazy as, as it might seem at first sight. And what the way, the way I think about this in, in a you know, more or less naturalized way is that um, Hegel, what Hegel is saying in the sense of logic when he's saying that teleology is the truth of mechanism is, our, is actually saying that mechanism cannot be considered as the ultimate explanatory principle when, at least when it comes to um, biological and cognitive systems, especially, and must be replaced by a more comprehensive form of explanation, one which, uh, in fact, um, reflects the, the specific regime of Geist. Um, so, and which basically is the self-referential circular uh, relation that characterizes um, biological, so living and, and cognitive systems, which in that sense are very, I, if not the same thing, at least strongly continuous with one another. Um, so in that sense, biological organisms can be studied by presupposing that they are intrinsically, intrinsically purposive agents. So for Hegel, in, in his specific context, the point is, 
um, understanding the, the 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 genealogy of, of Geist. How how do you really understand Geist, which is the the, the core element of the the entire um, the entirety of Hegel's philosophy? And if you want to understand Geist, you need you need to assume intrinsic propositiveness as um, as an explanatory mode, as the key explanatory mode. Otherwise, you're not going to get out of it. Um, so. Um, in when when it comes to to Varela, as I was saying, there is um, there is two. So this is what Hegel says, and now I'm going to try to apply it to to um, to, to, to the, the Varelian tradition. As I was saying, we, we use that characterization to distinguish the inactive approach and the, the position of the, the the theoretical position of the inactive approach, both within the autonomy uh, tradition, which is largely coming out of Varela um, and, and within the larger context of embodied cognition. So uh, when it comes to uh, Varela's legacy or the, the autonomy tradition, we call this the, uh, the autonomy tradition because it stems from a collection of papers that was published by, um, was published by, by Varela in uh, 1979 as the, with the title Principle of Biological Autonomy was then re-elaborated uh, in different forms, in in the most famous publication by Varela with uh, with uh, with Humberto Maturana, uh, which is known as Autopoiesis and Cognition, is actually a paper that was called Autopoiesis that the the organization of the living. It's a paper that was appeared in the mid seventies and one that was then first published in in, in Spanish and then appeared in in eighty one in, in in English by by Kluver. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the, the modern uh, version of this is the, the 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 book by Alvaro Moreno and Matteo Mosio that was published in 2015. That kind of like synthesizes a lot of research that has been going on here at the University of the Basque Country with many co-authors and, uh, in a sense, uh, disciples of, of Alvaro Moreno throughout more or less. 15 to 20 years, and which integrates Varela, did this biological side, integrates Varela with other, um, other um, streams of theoretical biology like Howard Patti, Robert Rosen, the work of Stuart Kaufman, especially in the, the, the 2000s. Um, and, and what try, tries to do is uh, set the, found, the theoretical foundation for how we can natural, ever naturalize account of this circular uh, causality, which um, um, uh, which biological systems uh, uh, display, and that allows us to give a naturalized account of of intrinsic propositiveness. And on the other hand, the as I was saying, the, the later Varela, the the, the the embodied mind was published with, with Ivan Thompson and Eleanor Roach as a very is a very um, ambitious book because Varela was a biologist, Ivan Thompson was a philosopher, and Eleanor Roach was a stud, was a scholar in, in, in body studies. And they tried to ba basically put together autopoiesis, phenomenology, and 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 the, the Buddhist idea that um, that you know phenomena don't have intrinsic. Uh, they're not intrinsically self-standing, uh, so it's it's a it's a very ambitious book. It's it, it, like in those cases, it doesn't really fulfill the, the promise of what, but it's a, in, as in many cases, it, it gave rise to, a, to an entire tradition, which was uh, one of the key uh, books was um, Mining Life by Ivan Thompson, that was published in 2007 after the passing of Varela, and more recently, uh, these two books, um, one of is the one I mentioned earlier, the linguistic bodies is more recent, 2020, I think, um, by Ezekiel Di Paolo and other co-authors that, on the other hand, integrates Varela legacy with another tradition, which is constituted essentially with the original stuff since the paper by Weber and Varela was phenomenology, uh, Jonas Merleau-Ponty, more recently, uh, philosophical anthropology, Plessner, Simon Don, uh, and linguistic bodies. There's a bunch of new um, of new influences that, that come in. Uh, so, and what we, we use this, this classical models uh, as, um, as, as a way of uh, kind of um, thinking about the, the difference is that uh, on the one hand, the, orga the, orga the organization as part tries to address Kant's problem by focusing on feature of biological organization that the biological organization has to possess in order to display agential capacity. So agency in, in, in on, on the one side is something that is to be explained by appealing to concepts such as closure, function, regulation. So basically uh, uh, 
agency and purposiveness is an explanandum, not an explanus. And the inactive approach, which is interested mainly in, in the relation between the cognitive agents and, and the environment and how this relation is, is articulated, uh, rather take a Gillian stance in the sense that they, they, they take uh, intrinsic purposiveness as, a, as a, not as an explanandum, but as an explanant. So they, they try to account for the perceptual and cognitive phenomena by presupposing that biological organisms are intrinsically purposive agents that interact with their environment. Um, so of course, um, this isn't going to be brief. It's not a watertight tradition, it's a water, watertight distinction, because, for example, in this very important paper by Ezekiel Di Paolo from 2005, he, he, of course, Ezekiel Di Paolo is on the on the on the inactive side. But here, this was for me, and still is the, the my, my favorite um, Di Paolo paper. Uh, and here, what is actually doing is 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 uh, is. Um, is doing what might be considered as a contribution to the organizational side of things, because it is actually what the argument of the paper is that, well, what are the conditions for, for agency? And he's saying that, well, autopoiesis is not sufficient for agency. You need another concept like adaptivity, which is the, the capacity of an organism to regulate itself with respect to the boundaries of its own viability. So the, we, we don't have to, to, to go into this in, in detail, but the, the, the main point here being that, uh, of course, it's not a watertight distinction, but still, uh, as a regulative principle, at least, uh, it, it's useful to have this, this, this distinction. Um, so when it comes to, um, so until now, I was, I was talking about the, the, the autonomy tradition and how, and how characterizing the Hegelian, the, the inactive approach as Hegelian allows us to, to, to kind of like pinpoint differences in, in within that tradition in what the different people are trying to do. Of course, they share, um, uh, main uh, the, the 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 core uh, theoretical foundations, but then what they do different things. They try to do different things, um, but but also the 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 characterization of the inactive approach as a Gillian allows us also to um, uh, pinpoint the specific character of um, uh, of the inactive approach within the, the what is called the, sometimes the, the four E. For e cognition, inactive, embodied, embedded, and extended. Um, so you have a bunch of different um, stream of literature that that deal with this. And in my opinion, um, there there are three main 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 lines. Uh, perhaps one one could think about their other other option, but this is what the, the kind of characterization we, we came up with. So in, in chronological order, the, the, the oldest one is um, Gibson's ecological psychology, which uh, the main concept is the concept of affordance and with the idea that um, essentially co cognition is, is essentially connected to, to action and the, with the idea that uh, um, cognition is, um, well, yeah, in, in an organism, an organism does not perceive uh, both we and 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 no, non-rational organisms uh, perceive the world not as uh, a simple computation of or, of a representation of, of state of uh, affairs, but as state 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 of affairs that allow us to to do something to to the. Um, to act in a certain way, um, and. Um, then there is the inactive approach that, that, as I was saying, was formulated in the, the early 90s and then developed for, for a decade, more or less. And, and more recently, in the early 2000s, the, the, um, the so-called sensory motor theory, which, in my opinion, is not entirely dissimilar um, from, from, from Gibson ecological psychology. The, 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 the main idea being, again, that, um, that perception is fundamentally connected to action and not to more or less contemplation or representation or computation and stuff like that. So what is what is the role, what is the, the, the specific difference of, of the of the um, uh, inactive approach in this general landscape? So what is the, the, the fundamental difference is that what no neither Gibson nor um, or Reagan and Noe ever really talk about the fact that organisms are purposive agents. Of course, one might say, well, maybe this is the underlying assumption, but there's no explicit um, 
thematization of uh, intrinsic purposiveness as as an explanation for this, which is instead the case for for the for the for the inactive approach. And I'm thinking especially at the at the, this um, uh, seminal paper by Weber and Varela in 2002, the the, the book um, the, the the 2005 paper by 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 Di Paolo, the 2007 book by Ivan Thompson. There is always so the fact that organisms are bring enact or bring forth a world is always related to the fact that they are purposive agents. And I'm going to expand on this in a bit. So um, just to give an overview of what I've been saying so far is that so the difference in um, between uh, the inactive approach and organizationism, so the, the fact that the inactive approach can be qualified as a Gillian is that uh, instead of studying the part, the way the parts determine the whole mechanically or more or less mechanically, there's debate going on, but yeah, this is the point. Uh, Hegelian stance focuses on organisms as wholes and on uh, as intrinsically purposive agents, whereas an organizational account, of course, uh, tries to develop a framework that is not non-reductive and 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 organicist in a way, but still tries to come up to it with with concepts like constraints, closure, uh, regulation, and how parts can can form in a certain way as to uh, to 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 have this circular to 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 um, to yeah to be get to the point to have this circular causality. And on the other hand, it's the, the difference between between um, the inactive approach and other uh, um, embodied approaches in, in, in the embodied cognition landscape is that um, contrarily to other approaches, the inactive approach roots agency and cognition into uh, intrinsic purpose, into the fact that organisms are intrinsically purposive agents. Um, in, in that sense, uh, natural agency is first and foremost a manifestation of the purposive organization of living systems. And I have a quote from Weber and Varela here, which is fundamentally and explicitly Hegelian they, when, when they say that an organism is a, is a center that organizes matter into a living being and its umwelt. Hence, inactive on this stage, the original split of subject and its world and it, their dialectical interrelatedness. It's the interrelatedness. Hegel, when he in, in, in the life chapter on the science and logic, talks about some something that he defines as the original um, judgment of life, using the, the because the German in German judgment is urteil, which is the original split, which is a, basically I don't know if they know they they basically quoting Hegel here without knowing it because the original split is what Hegel calls the the the, uh, the urteil this labels uh, the, the the original uh, split of life uh, and how how is this original split between subject and object articulated in in an, in an active perspective so the, the classical example this example is everywhere if you are when you start familiarizing yourself with this kind of literature the the example of bacteria chemotaxis is everywhere Everyone talks about it. It's uh, it's it's really it's, uh, you cannot turn any, anywhere without finding this reference. And, and as far as I know, the the first um, occurrence of the reference is in a paper by Varela in 1997 entitled "Patterns of Life Inter Inter Intertwining in Identity and Cognition." Uh, one of the famous instances that I found was in this book by Kaufman called Investigation that was published in, in 2000. And uh, it's, a, it's a very way of putting it because it's very provocative. And uh, uh, Kaufman says, um, consider a bacterium swimming upstream in a glucose gradient. If we naively ask, what is it doing? We unhesitatingly, uh, uh, unhesitatingly answer something like, it's going to get dinner. That is without attributing consciousness or conscious purpose, or we could say representation, we, we view the bacterium as acting on its own behalf in an environment. So this is um, a clear and somewhat provocative representation of what we were saying. Uh, so the, the, the fact that, that, that you have uh, um, uh, Umwelt, a milieu. There's also a very, very important um, paper, um, classic paper by Kangiem on the living in its milieu that also relies a lot of, uh, on Fonuk school and kind of like says the same thing. So the, you, you, maybe you have a geographical environment, but you don't, you don't have an Umwelt without the point of view of an organism because as um, 
uh, Thompson says uh, in this quote from this paper that then got integrated into the book, that, that sucrose is a nutrient, isn't intrinsic to the sucrose as a, um, to, uh, to the structure of the sucrose molecule itself. It's a relational feature linked to the bacteria's metabolism. So sucrose has significance or value as food, but only in the milieu that the organism itself brings into existence. So in the sense is that it's the action, the action of external factor is always mediated by, so the, the geographical environment is always mediated by the intrinsic autonomy of the system that endows the system um, uh, with a point of view on its milieu. So basically, again, it's the, the particular uh, purpose of organization that distinguishes organism that allows something as a, as a new belt to, to, to appear. Um, and the, the way that Hegel put, I, I, I avoided putting long quotes because Hegel is um, very obscure, as uh, famously very obscure, and I didn't want to uh, um, encumber uh, the, the the talk with very long quotes. But this is a quote I like, and I choose to and I cut it a little bit uh, so that it's understandable. But Hegel, in the in the beginning of the philosophy of nature, says says that organic individuality exists as subjectivity in, because in, the, in its process outwards, so the, 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 um, the fact that the organisms looks for, uh, the, the, organ, the organism metabolism is related to the fact of exchanging uh, matter and energy with the, with the environment, the organisms preserves itself within the unity of selfhood. And my, my first mentor, Luca Letterati, is something that when I was a student, he used to say, well, it's very, it's something he kept insisting was like one, uh, uh, one of these battle horses that, well, the, in Hegel, the, contrarily to the non-naturalistic reading of Hegel, the, the concept of subjectivity, which is one of the, the key concepts of Hegel's metaphysics, does not appear in, in, in the philosophy of spirit, but appears in the philosophy of nature when Hegel is talking about living organisms. So again, it's uh, this idea of, um, of organisms are, as active agents as, or as subjects uh, in, 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 in a somewhat deflationary sense. So uh, I'm almost done. I have a couple of slides uh, that, so this was the, the key aspect on, on organismal agency. There is another topic that is very, very well debated in, 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 in the literature on, on German idealism and Hegel especially, um, that is very connected to the so-called uh, the Pittsburgh School that was very indebted to the work of um, especially John McDowell. Uh, and the concept of second nature. Um, I'm not going to get into that too much, but just to, to give a little bit of context. So the, the, the general point is a nice book by Thomas Kurana that was that appeared in 2017, I think. Uh, and the point is um, the relation between first and second nature. So uh, of course, Hegel says that um, uh, purposiveness on the one hand, what, what the whole thing that I've been trying to argue for is that purposiveness should not be understood as an exclusive feature of conscious rational mind, which was essentially Kant's position, but rather as a general attribute of biological behavior. So the whole, again, I reiterate this because it's very important. The whole point of idealist philosophy of nature is that, and in the sense which allows us to, to have a very naturalistically minded reading of German idealism is that, at least in the, in the, from, my, from my perspective, is that, so we, we need we need to stop this idea that you know rational uh, purposiveness is something that only concerns rational beings, but you really you really need to uh, scale it down to to have the foundation of of that in 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 um, in natural autonomous agency. Uh, of course, yet Hegel is is in fact a philosopher of spirit and is also emphasizing that. Um, Agency as a general biological phenomenon should not per se. Of course, we need to scale it down and ground it down to to to, to biological agency, but we should it should not too cool be assimilated to, to conscious rationality because natural agency. Uh, this uh, uh, one of the additions from the in the philosophy of nature uh, that natural agency, like for example, drives uh, instincts stuff like that, is analogous. To the understanding of self-conscious entity, but because of this, one must not think of the purposive action of nature as a self-conscious understanding. This is very important. So the, there still is uh, um, a shift when it comes to to, to self-consciousness. 
And this is arguably another point that is very, um, that shows a, a very remarkable convergence with, with debates within the inactive approach. Um, because of course, in the, in the classical, uh, in the classical formulation by Maturana and Varela that in, in Autopoiesis and Cognition, uh, they say that the original position out, as also exemplified by the title Autopoiesis and Cognition, what, it, what they're arguing is that living systems are cognitive systems and that living as a process is a process of cognition per se. So basically you have an equation there. You have an equation between life and cognition, life and mind. Uh, and what Hegel has, uh, is arguing and what people like Ezekiel Di Paolo uh, and others have been recently emphasizing, contrarily to, to this original, it, this is kind of like a further development and, and a correction of the original position by Maturana and Varela, is that of course, we need to emphasize very much as what Hegel, at least the way I read Hegel, we need to emphasize the continuity between life and mind, but this does not per se amount to an identity. Mental phenomena are fundamentally grounded in organismal agency, and yet mind with, it, with its linguistic intersubjective feature transform natural agency of organisms into something else entirely. This is a point that is very, very interestingly made by, by Plesner in his uh, um, uh, the, the levels of the organic, organic and the human. It's one of the core elements of German philosophical anthropology. And it's been, it's been, it has been um, reiterated in a way by, uh, in, in a very interesting way by Lenny Moss in recent years, who has been working on, on Plesner a lot and has been um, recently uh, interested in, in, in our work on Hegel. Um, uh, and and uh, and of course it, the the way the way Plesner um, Plesner um, uh, thinks about this is the, the the concept of natural detachment or ex humans are have an extrinsic position. Ex it's not extrinsic; it's an ex eccentric positionality uh, with respect to the um, to the um, to. To, to other organisms. And this is a very nice quote, of, oh, it's another paper from Phenomenology and the Cognitive Sciences, 2001. Uh, Such an approach gives naturalistic grace to Hegel's proclamation that spirit is the truth of nature in the sense that it's something, it transforms nature into something else. So this was me, uh, it was yeah more or less 45 minutes. Um, uh, thanks for the attention. So if you're interested in the more uh, extended version, the, 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 this, this, this is the paper that you, you can find online, it's open access. And if for those for those who don't know me, as part of the, of the of my European project, we recently launched this uh, blog that's called Dialectical Systems. As the, the idea is to try to um, uh, not only publish papers but also have a more uh, wider engagement on um, with 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 the community, with the interdisciplinary community of biologists, ecologists, cognitive scientists, and biology that like to think about organisms more or less in the way I've been trying to articulate. We are active on Twitter. Uh, we've been we've been active for for a couple of weeks. We, we we opened up our our public we, we published short pieces so the first two like two two thousand words um, a couple of pieces by by Ezekiel Di Paolo being published which I I, I really liked um, so if you are interested in uh, this kind of perspective on organisms uh, give us a follow and thank you very much um, we can open the floor to questions. <laughs>